Welcome to Social Work Live at the Columbia School of Social Work. My name is Michael Friedman. I teach health policy and mental health policy here. And each week we interview a member of our community to discuss the latest in social work practice. After 15 minutes, we will open up for discussion and your questions, which you can post in the comments section. This week I'm honored to be speaking with uh, Dean Erwin Garfinkel. Uh, and he and I are going to talk about the social policy uh, after the election uh, yesterday. Uh, the dean has done tremendous work on uh, social policy issues over the years, so I'm really interested in hearing your reactions to this. Obviously, we all know what, what happened, yeah. uh, at least in broad, a few outstanding races, the uh, uh, the Republicans will continue to hold the Senate, and the Democrats have now taken control of the House. Uh, and that has, of course, some important implications, which we'll talk about. And I thought maybe we could start with talking about health, because as this election unfolded, the Democrats focused very heavily on health issues and covering pre-existing conditions particularly. So I wonder what you're thinking about that. A big sigh of relief <laughs> to start with. Um, I think had the Republicans uh, won, retained the House, that uh, we would have, uh, we, we would no longer have uh, pre-existing conditions covered. Um, the Republicans uh, were forced to uh, change their stripes, so to speak, and say they favored pre-existing conditions, uh, but they didn't. Uh, in fact, they have a suit uh, right now uh, uh, pending uh, trying to get rid of the uh, clause that protects pre-existing conditions. So uh, first thing is, as I say, a big a sigh of relief um, for those with pre-existing conditions. More generally, a big sigh of relief uh, for the expansion of health insurance that has taken place under so-called Obamacare. Do, do, do you think that there's any possibility that uh, we could, or they could do the work that needs to be done to improve Obamacare? On question, everybody acknowledges, uh, as with anything new, yeah. uh, has to have a shakedown period and then needs improvement. Do you think we can get anything done? I have no idea, actually. Mm. It's um, maybe, but I wouldn't bet on it. Um, I think the uh, on things are. It's possible that now that the Democrats control the House, that the uh, Republican Senate uh, would not try to go its own way because right. they wouldn't get anything. So some things are likely to happen. Um, uh, I think infrastructure uh, is the most likely thing that the. Uh, but even there, um, I'm not sure things will happen. With respect to health care, um, hard to say what's going to happen. Um, it's, uh, we know what's not going to happen, I would say, and that's the relief part. Uh, whether some good minor things can happen that would uh, involve legislation, uh, I don't know. It's hard to predict. What I... But I, I want to say, um, and this is more general than just health care, but the um, possibility of uh, curtailing the progress that we've had uh, through administrative initiatives still exists. So there's a threat there. Uh, well, we should come back to that, yeah. that I think. One of, one of the other things that I did want to ask you about is that there's been a big push by the Republicans to end entitlement programs and to replace them with block grants. Yeah. So that's uh, off the table. You think that's gone? Now? Well, sorry, it's off the table for the next two years. You think? Okay. Yes. Oh, the Democrats will not agree to that. Uh, certainly, will not agree to it with respect to Medicaid, and not agree with the with respect to food stamps, uh, SNAP. Uh, so, uh, no, that won't happen. Um, I think what, so I want to be positive for a moment here. Oh, good. <laughs> I think what is very likely to happen is that we're going to have more states um, 
sign up for Medicaid expansion. Well, that's interesting. That, that's already happened, right? Uh, and it's a live issue uh, in several states. Um, that, uh, and my guess is that will increase now. And my guess is it will still be an issue when we go to the 2020 election. Well, that would be a very positive development. I, I, as you know, once the Supreme Court ruled that states didn't have to uh, yes. do the Medicaid expansion, there were a number of states that opted out, and uh, the additional coverage fell short by about 10 or 12 million people uh, yes. because of that. So it would be terrific if So that, we've already had a couple states now that have uh, since signed up, and, mm -hmm. and there were a couple states where this was an issue, and actually I, I don't know exactly what happened at the state level. Um, uh, I do know that the Democrats uh, took back uh, several governorships. That would make mm -hmm. a huge difference uh, in this domain. But I think most of the states where they did, uh, there had already been expansion. Yeah. But that would not be true of Georgia, I don't think. And Georgia will be, in, I think, be interesting to, interesting see, what to see what happens yeah. in Georgia. Well, it will be interesting to, yeah. to really just create a chart and, and yes. uh, see yeah. uh, where there are now Democratic and actually, governors. And uh, later this, uh, right after this show, we've got a, uh, a session of policy faculty. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to hear what Heidi Allen has to say. Uh, at that session because right. I think she knows the details and um, uh, that she may even have that chart. <laughs> so, so I think people can tune into that show as well. It's not yes. a show, but I think it's going to be recorded. It, it is going to be uh, uh, it may be It may be live as well. Yes. Um, so there'll be an interesting discussion there. Maybe I can just change the, the, the subject. Yeah. Uh, one of the other really huge areas of concern is Social Security. Yes. Uh, the Republicans have said that now that uh, uh, they've given this great tax cut and uh, the deficit has gone up, we have to do something responsible about the deficit <laughs> by cutting back spending on other things. Yes. Uh, and Social Security is, uh, is on their list. Uh, so the biggest advocate for that was Paul Ryan, and uh, he is uh, not going to be back, not only not as Speaker, but... He's not running for the Congress. I think that's because he's probably running for the president. Next time around. So I think yeah. uh, that, that will uh, come up. So this is unfortunate that um, the uh, Democrats didn't take back the Senate as well because had they, uh, given President Trump's uh, public statements about Social Security, which was not to cut, and he's never contradicted himself on that. Right. Um, but the Republican Senate is not likely to go along with a compromise. We need a compromise. This is an area, and the sooner the better. Um, it's not a big deal, actually, financially. It's a big deal, though, ideologically. Mm -hmm. So, and we know how to make this compromise. Uh, Maybe you can say some more yeah. about you referring to the problems with the Social Security Trust Fund. Trust Fund, yeah. yeah. So, so maybe you can so elaborate we on can, that. In, a, in another 15, 20 years, uh, when the Trust Fund runs out, we'll only be able to pay, I think it's 75% of uh, promised benefits. Now, 15, 20 years from now, 75% of promised benefits, turns out, is actually more than what we're giving the elderly right now, oh, today. interesting. Yeah, so there's, it's not a need to panic, but if we don't raise it, the relative living standards of the elderly compared to the non-elderly would drop. Not their absolute standard right. of living, but the relative standard also of Also people on disability. Same with people on disability, right. exactly. Um, and the, the deficit is not that large. We, it could entirely be paid for by raising the uh, uh, tax limit. We only tax the first 125, 128 something like now, that, 128,000 yeah. of earnings. If we were to raise that to the same level 
that Medicare uh, ta taxes, mm -hmm. it's a couple, 250 or something like that, that would fill 95% of the gap. Is that right? All by itself. That's interesting. Uh, we're not going to do that. There's going to have to be some cut in benefits. It's going to have to be some increase in taxes, some cut in benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so the, t the two kinds of cuts in benefits that, that uh, I think of yeah. most often are increasing the age, the retirement age, yes. uh, would be one. And the other is uh, tinkering with the cost of living adjustment in some way. Yes. I, don't, I don't know what you think of that. So um, raising the retirement age seems like the most natural thing to do because lifespans are increasing. Yeah. And at some level, um, that's right, but it's very class uh, discriminatory. So uh, it, people who are living longer are people who are well-educated. Uh, and the difference between those who are poorly educated and well-educated in terms of living longer mm -hmm. is, uh, is huge. So if we were just to raise the retirement age, uh, that's not very good for people who work with their hands right. and um, are working class uh, populations. We could compensate for that. Uh, we could um, only raise the retirement age for people with very high earnings, but we're not going to do that. Too complicated. It's too complicated. So um, while it seems like a wonderful, simple solution, and, and it, I believe, has to be part of the solution, actually. Well, the, the last compromise, as yes. I recall, uh, I remember when the, 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 the maximum earnings were something like $40,000, yeah. uh, probably in 1935, that, yeah. it was a lot lower <laughs> than that. But I remember $40,000, yeah. and now it's 128. But there yeah. was a, an agreement at that time, I think Moynihan was, was central to working that out with the Republicans, that there was yeah. going to be an increase in taxation, an increase uh, in the age of retirement. And I don't know if they dealt with the cost of living adjustment at that time. They didn't do anything with the cost of living adjustment, and uh, I'm not keen on that You're not. either. No. Um, it's a – so it's a complicated issue, yeah. but it's it, – it, um, it, it's – uh, it's less appealing to me than uh, cutting benefits in a, at the top end a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, it, okay. it, uh, I think it just want to be more progressive right. than uh, across the board. Well, let's hope that uh, they can get together and, uh, and, and that, deal with this issue. We do have a little time. It's, it's not till 2034 that the trust fund runs out, and then, as you say... Yes, but this uh, is already 2018, yes, so yes. we're talking about <laughs> it's not that far away. It seems, <laughs> it seems far away, yeah. doesn't it? But, <laughs> well, it seems closer to me now than yes, when I first well, started uh, talking about it. I was it. just going to say, are you and I going to make it? <laughs> Well, let's Who hope knows? so. Let's <laughs> hope so. Let's, let's hope so. But, of course, you're talking about dealing with the elderly population, and, and one of the really big issues in the United States today is the growth of the aging population. Yes. And uh, I, I think that that's mostly been ignored uh, in Washington in, in recent well, years. Well, and here's, here's a little segue. Um, so part of the solution to the Social Security problem uh, of aging, sorry, of aging right. and social security problem is to have more young people come into the country. Uh -huh. That's called immigration. That's right. And the United States of America has a comparative advantage compared to other countries that beat the band. We have a tradition of immigration, uh, and a lot of people feel very positively about that because they're the sons and daughters of immigrants, and um, we're squandering that because of President Trump's uh, just xenophobic, uh, racist appeals. But I f it's one of the things I take pleasure and uh, comfort from the election is I think that um, that's part of the rejection of uh, Trump was the 
So I, I think you're clearly right. If we think about the people who provide long-term care, for example, uh, oh. they're, they're largely immigrants. If, if we cut off the low-skilled immigrants from coming into the country, which is what they're talking about yeah. doing, uh, uh, who's going to take care of us when we can't take care of ourselves anymore? Hopefully that never happens, <laughs> but if we need it, who's going to be there? Yeah. The other area is that they're talking about finding agreement about infrastructure. Yes. And I don't know how you do infrastructure without immigrants. Who, who, who built all the bridges and tunnels and highways that we have now, the, the railroads in the 19th century? Yeah. Who, who built all that? Yeah, well, actually, that, that was the railroads led to the first uh, Chinese exclusion. <laughs> well, uh, yes. It, <laughs> the, the these Chinese, things are not all positive. The Chinese were doing so well on the... the the natives became very fearful yeah. <laughs> of the, but um, it's it's a uh, so I would say with respect to social welfare policy uh, besides health uh, there's uh, uh, food stamps uh, SNAP was under threat mm -hmm. um, and is less so now it's right. not zero again things can be done administratively but in terms of legislation. Cutting back food stamps, the right. Democrats will not allow that. Uh, pro they won't allow it to become the law of the land that food stamps have to be uh, work tested or Medicaid work tested. So, I, I but that is being done administratively. I said before we should come something. back to that. Yes. So, I know the healthcare field better than than the others, yeah. and and uh, you know SNAP and. Probably, yeah. I don't know what's going on with TANF and yeah. and some of the others, but in in healthcare, they've they've got a lot going on to try to some hold, states hold down cost. Well, and the the I, so this is an absolutely crazy idea: work testing Medicaid benefits. So I I actually um, favored a social productivity test. Uh -huh. in, in uh, HEMP and cash assistance. And I, I, I regret that because I think the way it was implemented, uh, it turned into a very crass work test that was uh, simply designed to get people off, off of it. Right. And right. Uh, it was mean, the way it was implemented. But I can't conceive of a sensible argument for work testing medical benefits. And, and actually, though, it highlights, really highlights the different philosophies that people have. If you believe medical care should be in a, a right, just like education, which there are good reasons for believing that, mm -hmm. it's so fundamental, uh, education and health, if you've got those two aspects of human capital, you can compete in the world. So uh, the idea that you would work test health care, would we work test education? <laughs> I mean, give me a break. It's, it's, so it's, it's an insane policy okay. on its face, and it just yeah. shows the runaway ideology of, of conservatives who are Actually, not conservative. It's a shame we use that word. I agree They're with radical. You. They are radical uh, unbelievers in the welfare state. Uh, we, and it's part, it's part of, uh, if you're really conservative, I would say that's something worth conserving. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, I think we do have uh, some risks that will continue because yes. of the kind of administrative changes that, that can be made. Um, That's some where some, we some have, of which yeah. in the healthcare field are, in my view, exceedingly brilliant. That is to say, that some really smart people came up with these ideas that probably won't work in reality. Yeah. But yeah. I confess I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> the changes just go over my head, some of them. Yeah. But you know, in, in New York State, for example, now there's a major uh, initiative going on to change all of Medicaid into managed care and to do that in ways that are very complicated, creating 
very elaborate administrative structures. But I'm sorry, I got onto one of my pet peeves. So <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> didn't, didn't mean to do that. So, what about uh, TANF? What about the housing uh, programs? So, TANF, um, maybe something will positive will happen there. It certainly, uh, I think, needs to be uh, it, uh, up for. Uh, renewal of the legislation so something has to be done with the Democrats in the lead um, maybe something positive will happen it's so small now yeah it's um, not a lot of money it's yeah it's, uh, there's practically no money there yeah. so uh, and as I say it's a shame the way work tests were implemented in that program yeah. I, I've become a little bit concerned about the federal housing programs, given some of the things that the head of HUD has been saying uh, yeah. uh, uh, lately about uh, raising it above thirty percent of income as a as a standard and so forth. But we we have another we have a question actually, okay. so All maybe right. we can come back to this. Yeah. It says the deficit is high, but why is it so hard to ask for the top one percent to be socially responsible? to lower the deficit by paying more tax instead of getting incentive to pay less? Uh, that's a very good idea. Um, unfortunately, the, the reason the deficit is so high now is because we just cut taxes. And we cut taxes on the uh, top 1%, a uh, huge portion of the tax cut accruing to the top 1%, inclu including the cut on the corporate uh, uh, profits tax. So I would say the first um, thing that needs to be done, but can't be done yet, um, to attack the deficit is to uh, repeal that tax cut. It's, um, and that's that's really likely to happen with a Republican Senate and, and a Republican president. Yeah, that will not happen uh, in the next two years. No. So it, at least yeah. with the House having gone to the Democrats, it's not likely there'll be another tax cut, uh, although President Trump was campaigning on giving yeah. another 10% right. tax cut. But he only thought of that as things were looking bad for the House. <laughs> we have another question or comment here. Um, they say, while not immediately policy related, but the question actually is, there's a need for increased consideration of mental health support for immigrant communities. Mm. Um, That's more your area, but yeah, I would well, agree. <laughs> you know, I think that, I think that there's uh, a need for increased mental health services generally, as I don't know if uh, this viewer knows, but uh, only 40% of people with diagnosable disorders actually get yeah. treatment. 60% do not. The capacity of the mental health system is too small to deal with issues as they are. That includes yeah. the immigrant uh, community. And there are a host of other issues. Uh, and, the effect, and the attack on the Affordable Care Act, if that happens, has a tremendous impact on the funding of mental health services because there are tens of millions of people, more than the 20 million who weren't covered at all, there were many people who weren't covered for mental health services before the ACA who are now. If the ACA goes, we're going to yeah. lose that possibility. And, of course, the talk about cutting Medicaid, which is the major single source of funding for behavioral health, it's, it's horrendous. Yeah. So we agree on that. <laughs> Do we have another question, or that's, that's it for now? All right, well, we can uh, uh, go back to, to some of these things. Uh, one of the things that I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, though, uh, if I'm sure you have some, and that is uh, public education and the funding of public education, uh, particularly higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the concerns that I have had has been sort of a trend to uh, disparage public education in this administration, and also there have been some attempts to cut Pell Grants, I understand. I don't know terribly much about this. Yeah. So also not my area of expertise, but the um, I think the uh, efforts to uh, privatize education, uh, mm -hmm. as symbolized by Betsy DeVos, right. 
are worrisome, very worrisome. Um, I hope that we successfully uh, resist that. Uh, we are have led the world because uh, because of uh, our education system. We uh, we were the leaders right. uh, in mass provision of public education, and it was public. It was not private. Um, and that it, so the idea that I, I, I empathize and sympathize with the idea of having um, competition uh, as a general matter. I'm uh, an economist as well as a social worker. So I uh, like the idea of competition, but the competition uh, via a private education uh, is not healthy for the public at large, and um, it's not the way to do it, not the way to do it. We have another question. Because of the Democratic House and Republican Senate, are we expecting to see a lot of stalling and disagreement <laughs> holding up progress in D.C.? Yes, <laughs> but that could be good, <laughs> as opposed to if the uh, Democrats sorry, the Republicans had held the House, I think we would have had less stalling, more legislation uh, that was negative and would have reduced uh, Medicaid benefits, would reduce food stamp benefits, possibly even try to reduce Social Security benefits. So relative to all those reductions, stalling and disagreement and holding up progress, which is really retrogress, uh, is a good thing. Um, what will happen after the 2020 election? Uh, we don't know at this point. Um, uh, things could, uh, we could have an all Republican Senate, House, and Presidency then, or perhaps we could have all Democrats. House, Senate, and President, or maybe <coughs> it could be some mix. At some point, there will be progress, uh, simply because some issues, like the uh, Social, Social Security, Security Trust Fund, are unavoidable. Um, but sometimes stalling and making no progress is better than movement in the wrong direction. One of the reasons for the lack of progress, of course, is that we are so divided as a yes. nation now. And you've recently written about that in the aftermath of the, uh, the, the murders in Pittsburgh, yes. as well as uh, in Tennessee and several other places in the country where, whether it's Jews or blacks or yeah. other groups, um, it, it's, it's not only divisions of political opinion that kind of entrenched hatreds that well so I think the there are two points I think to make so President Trump uh, didn't invent racism he didn't invent anti-semitism these are very old and the um, anti-semites and racists uh, exist uh, in the United States um, wish there were fewer of them, but they exist. They're out there. But what President Trump has done is appeal to, and worse than appeal to, he's stoked the hatred. Um, I, I hate to say this, but he fits the classical definition of a demagogue, um, which is someone who appeals to hate to further their own political advantage. We've had congressmen who were demagogues, we've had senators who were demagogues, we've had governors who were demagogues. We've never had a president before who was a demagogue. So um, that's very scary and it's one of the reasons that um, I'm overjoyed. <laughs> that the Democrats took back the House 
because if they hadn't, uh, it would have been a reward. Uh, he's already gotten plenty of awards, uh, rewards for being a demagogue. Um, it's pretty scary because the Republican Party is kind of moved big time in that direction. Not that they weren't, right. not that they weren't zero before. They, there were plenty of appeals, but not the systematic kind. And it wasn't done by the candidates themselves. It was always a proxy. Right. This this case. Trump has gone out and uh, <coughs> does dog whistles uh, in Charlottesville, the idea that there were equal blame on both sides. We've never had anything like that. It's so it's... It's a it, frightening time. It's very frightening, very frightening. Oh. And um, uh, I just hope Republicans of goodwill, of which there are lots, uh, and I think that a huge number of Republican women in the suburbs, well-educated women, uh, abandon the Republicans precisely for this reason, and I just hope they lead the way and persuade their husbands and partners to go with them because this is not the America that uh, I grew up in. Uh, it's not the America I love. It's scary. Well, on that note, we're going to move to uh, to wrap up. Uh, we started off with a positive uh, a note about uh, where we could go and at least how we could fend off some threats. And we've ended on this frightening note about what's happening in America today. I want to thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you. Much appreciated. I and remain uh, positive, hopeful. Okay. <laughs> in, despite the frightening times. I want to thank the audience for tuning in. And uh, next week we'll be back at our usual time, which is 12 noon. And uh, the uh, person I'm going to interview is Professor Niraj Kaushal. Uh, we'll be talking about U.S. immigration policy. Hope to see you next week, or I hope you see us next week. Thank you. <laughs>